Hey, all Scott here. First, I want to take a second to thank all the show's listeners, sponsors, and supporters for helping make this show what it is. I literally couldn't do it without you. And now I want to tell you about the newest way to help support the show. Whenever you shop at Amazon.com, stop by ScottHorton.org first and just click the Amazon logo on the right side of the page. That way, the show will get a kickback from Amazon's end of the sale. It won't cost you an extra cent. And it's not just books. Amazon.com sells just about everything in the world except cars, I think. So whatever you need, they've got it. Just click the Amazon logo on the right side of the page at ScottHorton.org or go to ScottHorton.org slash Amazon. All right, you guys, welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show, The Scott Horton Show. Our first guest up today is Phil Giraldi. He's a former CIA and DIA officer, and he writes for uh, the American Conservative Magazine and owns.com. Welcome back to the show, Phil. How are you doing? I'm fine, Scott. Good deal. Uh, happy to have you back. And uh, I'm sorry I don't have your article in front of me anymore because I'm running a check disc, and it's taken forever. But I read it this morning. And it's all about Israeli spying. I don't remember the title, sorry, but it's uh, unz.com, unz.com, brand new by Phil Giraldi, about um, Israeli spying and about Jeff Stein's uh, two pieces in Newsweek about Israeli spying and, and a great deal about Palestine as well. So uh, I guess uh, let's start with, you want to start with the failed talks here and what it all means? Well, I, basically, I mean, it's all part of one story. I mean, the, the failed talks are, are are a symptom of the dysfunctional foreign policy in the Middle East, and uh, Israeli spying, spying is kind of the uh, the underhanded uh, side of that story, that uh, uh, the Israelis, uh, uh, while torpedoing the talks, and I think it's it's become very clear that the um, the White House and State Department are blaming the Israelis uh, for the first time ever. Uh, the Israelis have uh, continued to spy on us, and this is uh, basically impacting on other aspects of, uh, of Middle Eastern policy. Right. Yeah, well, let's talk about that. The, the first time ever that uh, the, uh, the White House has been so blatant, they always say, oh, Arafat should have accepted the greatest deal ever without really describing what it was he rejected. <laughs> Because once you get yeah. to the details, it wasn't that great of an offer after all. Um, but we can always expect that kind of spin. But in this case, it really was sort of blatant, where really the consensus, even in all the Israeli papers and the American ones, uh, and among, as you mentioned, uh, among uh, the president and the secretary of state as well, is that, hey, the Israelis blew it this time. Yeah, well, I mean, what basically happened was that the uh, apparently Kerry had worked out some kind of preliminary deal with the uh, with the Palestinians, and the Israelis appeared to be going along with it. Uh, and the very morning that uh, of the day when they would have been announcing uh, that they were moving forward, the Israelis announced 700 new houses in uh, uh, East Jerusalem, which uh, basically destroyed any possibility of a deal. And then there were other things too. Obviously, there have been uh, a number of stories. I'm sure you've read in in the Israeli media uh, about Netanyahu apparently has a, a long history of uh, of doing this sort of thing, you know, creeping up to the point where he can talk the talk like he's interested in peace, but then doing something that he knows will will uh, will end the talks right there. So it's uh, it's kind of interesting to see this. Everybody now is is apart from the very strong partisans of of, of Israel in the United States. Uh, everybody now has kind of figured out, hey, this is not really as much a Palestinian problem as it is an Israeli problem. Right. Well, and the thing of it is too is it really drives home that the U.S. doesn't necessarily even have to stop them. Uh, from doing what they're doing. We just have to stop covering for them all the time because everyone else in the world's against them at this point. They would, without American diplomatic cover and, of course, uh, you know, monetary and military subsidy, uh, they would have to figure out an, an entirely different foreign policy, almost certainly uh, not including a continuing occupation of the West Bank. Yeah, that's right. And, and uh, the funny, one of the funny, you know, side stories of this, which which I think you probably saw today, was apparently the the guy who leaked all this stuff uh, about the Israelis being the ones that torpedoed it was Martin Indyk. And there couldn't be a stronger partisan in the world for Israel than Martin Indyk, uh, chief U.S. negotiator, uh, uh, who was basically has been accused of being uh, leaning towards Israel and everything he does. But he realizes that unless the the Israelis seize the opportunity to create a uh, two states, 
uh, it's going to become a binational state eventually. It's got to happen. And and then if, if anybody wanted uh, Jewish identity for the state of Israel, it's going to be gone. So Indic has understood this, and uh, somehow uh, Benjamin Netanyahu can't quite get it. Right. Yeah, he even uh, gave a speech the other day. Um, I saw, I'm trying to remember... Uh who originally quoted it, but then Laura Rosen provided the footnote. She was there as well, the investigative reporter Laura Rosen. So whoever it was that originally tweeted it, it was, uh, you know, she was verifying it. Was it Landay? It wasn't Landay. Anyway, uh, and then, yeah, that was the quote was just outright, hey, uh, simple as simple could be, it was the Israeli side that ruined the deal this time, and it's and it's really too damn bad. And now Martin Indyk, for people not familiar, he goes back with the Israel lobby in America. He helped found the Washington Institute for Near East Policy for them back in the 80s, right? That's correct, yeah. He's a... Uh... He's a he's an APAC guy all the way, and and uh, for him to come out with this shows the level of frustration that the administration is feeling about about uh, the positions that Israel is taking. Uh, it's it's uh, it's it's quite astonishing, you know. But but then again, you know, we have Congress to deal with, we have the media to deal with. It's not exactly like suddenly the, the you know we woke up this morning and everything has changed. It hasn't. Well, that's the thing. I was just about to ask you, how can the policy, how can the Israeli policy be so self-destructive uh, for so long in a row like this, but then you said Congress, and that's the answer, right? They are confident that the Israel lobby in Washington, D.C. has enough of a control over Congress that nothing is ever going to get too far out of hand as far as America protecting whatever, whatever it is they perceive their interest to be. Yeah, clearly Congress is, is is still in the pocket of the of the Israel lobby. There's not going to be any shift on that for the foreseeable future unless we have a dramatic change in who gets elected in in November. But I don't see that. And, and you know, it's just it's it's the same old story that uh, basically uh, interest groups in the United States, whatever they are, whether it's an interest group for Israel or for uh, for various other uh, interest groups, uh, it, 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 they wield a tremendous amount of power because they uh, they control the uh, the contributions to the, to the congressman and they control re-election. So, well, now we're, that the narrative is that. now that the narrative is changing, do you think that that power dynamic is going to change at all? Because, you know, the whole mythology about you know the poor Israelis are besieged by the Palestinians and all of that kind of thing, or or at least every time. I mean, that's more for the rubes. But at least in D.C., the the narrative is always that. It's all the Palestinians' fault that they can't ever get their act together enough for the Israelis to deal with them well or whatever. But since that narrative is falling away, uh, I wonder if just, you know, cash and threats and that, those kind of politics will be enough to keep all of Congress in line when it's just becoming more and more apparent to everyone, as, as John Kerry put it to the Trilateral Commission, uh, that, uh, hey, we're dealing with an apartheid state or we're on the verge of having an apartheid state under this uh, under the definition of you know minority rule i think he meant yeah well yeah, yeah you're absolutely right i mean the, 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 i've written about this too where there's the, there's been a dramatic shift in terms of perceptions and 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 that after a certain point is going to you know the way israel behaves and everything is not going to be sustainable but uh, uh the other interesting aspect of this is is of course the other half of my story about the spying mm -hmm. because the this whole spying these spying stories uh came out uh basically for the first time in the mainstream media now, that's the important thing. It's in the mainstream media, Newsweek, and it was picked up in a number of other places. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is because Israel was pushing to get this visa waiver for Israelis so they could travel freely to the United States. And the intelligence community and the defense community went to Congress in closed session and said this would be a disaster. Israel spies on us more than anybody, and they provided all the details. Uh, again, this was a closed, you know, uh, confidential session. It provided all the details to such an extent that apparently, according to Jeff Stein, who wrote the articles, the, uh, the, the congressmen and their staffers, all of whom to a man and woman were pro-Israeli, were shocked, were stunned. So uh, this all came out, and the result is going to be, that, so it seems, that the intelligence community, defense community, national security community, all united on this. They're saying if you open the door to Israelis coming here, we're going to have a huge problem like 9-11 when we had art students and Israeli intelligence officers operating all over the United States. That would come back, 
And and that's basically what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's going to be very difficult for Congress to try to get this waiver through. Uh, they're still trying. Uh, but the fact is that, uh, you know, Israel, every time it turns around lately, is making its own worst case. And, and that's what we're seeing. Yep. Well, you know, it's, it's a, a great thing, too, that it's Jeff Stein that did this reporting. As you mentioned, it's in Newsweek, uh, because that's where he is now. I mean, he used to write for Congressional Quarterly back when he broke the Harmon story, which is great and stuff, or, you know, along these same lines. But who the hell yeah. reads Congressional Quarterly unless you're really into this kind of thing about, you know, what Israeli spies are caught doing on the phone around here, uh, or what Jane Harmon's up to. Uh, it didn't really get that much play. But now that he's writing at Newsweek, that's a lot bigger footprint, uh, even in the latest version of it. And then in in the Israeli press, they try to resort to saying oh, it was a pol an Israeli politician. I, I forget who. I don't think it was Netanyahu, but one of his ministers was quoted saying, "Well, there's a whiff of anti-Semitism here," as though mm, yeah. you know Jeff Stein is either an anti-Semite himself or just way too dull to figure out that these intelligence community briefers and the staffers who receive their briefings are all just a bunch of closet Nazis, which is why they would make up these atrocious lies. <laughs> and all that I thought was so silly that it only just bolstered the case that, you know, we're talking about Jeff Stein here. You point out in your article, I didn't realize that he's a former military intelligence officer himself. I certainly knew that he's a very credible intelligence beat reporter, and they dare not attack his credibility as a journalist, but trying to, they try to at least imply that, well, at least the guys he's talking to must be anti-Semites or something, but I don't think that stuck this time. It was he's well, too they, good. They, they tried to go after Paul Pilar, the former CIA officer, because he's quoted um, by by Jeff Stein. And of course, Pilar's credentials are impeccable. He's never been an Israel basher, right. and and uh, so they, a number of um, of Israeli publications and some publications in the U.S. also they went after him. And the great thing about Stein was he had his first article, which talked about the Israeli spying, how it was connected with this visa waiver program, mm. and then he followed it up when they started attacking him with another article. Yeah, about their cover-ups. Now hold it right there. Yeah, I'm sorry, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back to Phil Giraldi in just a sec. The military-industrial complex. The disastrous rise of misplaced power. Hey, all Scott Horton here. I'd like for you to read this book, The War State, by Michael Swanson. America's always gone to war a lot, though in older times it would disarm for a bit between each one. But in World War II, the U.S. built a military and intelligence apparatus so large, it ended up reducing the former constitutional government to an almost ceremonial role and converting our economy into an engine of destruction. In The War State, Michael Swanson does a great job telling the sordid history of the rise of this national security state, relying on important first-hand source material, but writing for you and me. Find out how Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy all alternately empowered and fought to control this imperial beast, and how the USA has gotten to where it is today. Corrupt, bankrupt, soaked in blood, despised by the world. The War State by Michael Swanson. Available at Amazon.com and at Audible.com. Or just click the logo in the right-hand margin at ScottHorton.org. We should take nothing for granted. All right, guys, welcome back. It's the show. I'm Scott Horton. I'm talking with Phil Giraldi, formerly a CIA and DIA officer. And now he writes for the American Conservative and for UNS.com, that's UNZ.com, where he's got a brand new piece about Israelis spying in America. And it's, uh, as we've been talking about, half the story of the uh, failed last round, and I mean last round, of the uh, so-called uh, two-state solution peace talks there in Israel, as well as uh, the other part of that same story, Israeli political influence in America, not just do they spy on the U.S. Um, military and uh, industrial-wise, economic-wise, and all that, but they do so with absolute impunity year in and year out due to that same uh, political power that they pull in Washington, D.C. And uh, so um, I'm often reminded, and I was mentioning this the other day, uh, to the people of uh, Christopher Ketchum's great uh, piece for Counterpunch, which you're featured in as a source, Phil, that begins, scratch a former intelligence officer, and he'll start talking to you about Israeli spying in America. In other words, that's, that's what you are all just champing at the bit, waiting to say if someone will give you a chance to tell us what we don't know about what the Israeli government is really up to in America. Because they know they'll always get away with it, and their story, the story will never really be told. So, so let us know, enlighten us, Phil. What's it like? 
Well, I mean, basically, uh, is, Israeli spying on the United States is the most massive spying program directed against the United States by anyone. Um, uh, you know, back in the old days when we had the uh, Soviet Union as an adversary, and uh, sure, they spied on us, but they were pretty limited in terms of what they could do. They would send in an occasional illegal if they could come up with one. Uh, they had their their KGB and GRU officers operating out of embassies and consulates. But we're not talking about a whole lot of people. We're, we're not talking about uh, a, a massive successful effort. The only real successes they had were volunteers who were Americans that volunteered to spy for the Soviet Union. So let's put that in context. The Israelis, however, have been spying on us since before the creation of the State of Israel. So, uh, or, or rather the proxies of, of the Israelis since they didn't exist. But the, uh, they've been spying on us for like uh, 60 years. And, and the fact is that they have stolen <laughs> uh, nuclear secrets, defense secrets, tech, military technologies, uh, commercial technologies that had military and industrial applications. They've stolen just about everything from us. Plus, they have uh, penetrated uh, a lot of our communication systems, uh, as, as Christopher Ketchum has uh, described. So the fact is the Israeli spying dust is not a joke. I mean, this is, this is, this is an incredible, massive effort to basically shift elements of our economy and our military technologies to Israel to benefit Israel. And that's what it's all about. And intelligence officers have known this for years. They've known just the extent to which Israelis turn up everywhere. And, of course, the, as, as uh, Jeff Stein points out in his second article, when they get caught, they don't even get slapped on the wrist. Uh, they get no punishment, and and this is this has been uh, this has been known to counterintelligence people at FBI and CIA people and everybody and people at the Pentagon and everybody else, and yet the Israelis get away with it and they get away with it and they get away with it, basically because the U.S. government, as Congress and the White House, are afraid to take them on. It really is incredible that you know when you have. Well, if you're me and you have access to former CIA people and, and can give them a chance to complain about how this works and what they know, um, it just it, the contrast between what I understand about this now, just from knowing people like you and Ray McGovern and others and, and reading my Christopher Ketchum, which you know most people don't, uh, the contrast between that and what I perceive to be at least the common narrative of what people understand about this, it's absolutely night and day. I think most people, if they considered it, if you ask them, they might say, well, yeah, I guess they must spy on us some or something. But for most people, it's never come up. The question, the subject has never been brought up at any moment in their lives. It's just not part of life in America that we discuss Israeli spying. It's just not part of anyone's narrative outside of yeah. such very few channels. And yet, as you explain, it's absolutely systematic and and uh, and, and goes far beyond whatever anybody else would be able to. Right? The, the Soviets would never be able to get away with that because they were our enemies at the time. But the Israelis, they can basically visa program or no, they can just run wild across America all day long and nobody's checking on them because they're our friends. It's almost uh, the assumption is that you know, hey, we're all gentlemen and friends here, and they wouldn't spy on us that much, would they? Because what if we got mad at them? And yet they know that we won't. And so that's the thing of it, is they go far beyond what people would assume would be their stopping point because of, of fears that, that we would clamp down on just what they're able to get away with if they go too far, you know? Yeah, well, it's some of the stuff that uh, Jeff Stein came out with were things that I knew, but you know, basically the way he pulled it together was beautiful. I mean, he said he just you know, he described how uh, the Secret Service agent was in Tel Aviv. Do, do, do you remember that part? And he was on the toilet. They had just cleared the uh, uh, hotel room suite that uh, uh, Al Gore, vice president, was supposed to be using. And he heard a scratching noise, and here was an Israeli intelligence officer coming through the air vent on what he thought was an empty room. Obviously, he was going to be putting in uh, recording devices and other things. And, and, you know, this kind of stuff is just... Uh, and, 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 well, and funny and there, he just coughed and said, like, hey, buddy, I'm here, so keep hiding yeah. instead of, like, hey, yeah. I'm calling you out. Get out of here, you know? 
Yeah, exactly. And then, and then Stein also, you know, recounts how when American scientists, they, they're in, you know, American scientists, academics, uh, uh, are invited to conferences over in Israel, and then, you know, and they go, and when they go there, they're pitched. They try to recruit them. If they get, if they think that the guy is vulnerable to, uh, to women, they'll send women into his room. If they think he's a, he likes drugs, they'll, they'll apply him with drugs, they'll apply him with alcohol. And all the classic kind of things you do to, uh, like I would have done when I was in the CIA, to a KGB guy or something. You look for the vulnerabilities. But these are Americans. These are American officials. These are American uh, academics. Uh, massive programs by the Israelis to to. to recruit these people and get them and get their information. I mean, it's just incredible. It's, uh, I don't, I, I, it's even, it's, uh, I recommend everybody read the two articles, the two Newsweek articles. The first one is great, and the second one in some ways is even better, where it describes how there's never any retribution for any of this stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and think about it. You know, we've been, we've been taking a hosing now for so many years, and, and how long is this supposed to go on? Yeah, indefinitely, I guess. Uh, yeah, you know, I talked with John Cole, the former FBI counterintelligence officer. I think you mentioned him in your speech at the uh, recent uh, reassessing the special relationship conference there, where uh, he said on this show that he knew of right around, I, or maybe it was exactly that he had counted them up or something, I don't know, but somewhere right around at least 150 counterintelligence cases that at least were contemplated, if not actually begun, and then shut down. For political reasons, so it would be yeah. you know one tenth of one percent of these ever go anywhere at all, and that's if you count Rosen and Weissman ultimately getting away with it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, and another interesting thing in the Stein article was how you know the State Department does threat assessments about the whole world, every country. They're mandated to do this every year, and they're afraid to write an honest threat assessment about traveling to Israel because they don't want to piss. Uh, Israel's friends in Congress off, because if they write an, uh, uh, an accurate assessment saying, look, if you have access to uh, classified information, if you're a scientist who works in technical areas that are of interest, you're going to be approached by Israeli intelligence officers. They're afraid to write that. Uh, you know, it's just, and it, it's, it, you keep thinking, my God, when do, you know, how do you, how do you get this across to these, these lunkhead Christian Zionists who, who claim to be patriotic Americans that were being raped by the Israelis? And we've been raped by the Israelis for years and years and years now. And, but I guess you can't get it across to them because they think God is on their side. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it really does. It's the kind of thing where if this was a movie or uh, a TV show or something, somewhere there's an adult who puts a stop to this stuff, rather than it just goes on and on and on with no accountability for anyone whatsoever. I mean, at least somebody at the FBI ought to be in trouble for continuing to let this go or something or something. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it, there's there's no adult supervision over the U.S. government at all. But I, I think you and I figured that out about ten years ago. Well, that's yeah, that's the real problem here is the the evil conspirators built a world empire that nobody can control. So it's all just up for grabs. And squeaky wheel gets the grease. I think is the best way to put it. And the Israel yeah. lobby, they're just relentless. You kind of gotta, as like Stephen Walt says, you kind of gotta respect them for play for using the democratic process in the most efficient and effective way possible. You know, I mean, I envy them as a peacenik. If only the, every peacenik in America could really be motivated to make the phone calls, to send the emails, to, to meet with their congressman, to follow up, to, to vow to never support that congressman again or to always support that one or always support that one's enemy or whatever it is the way the Israel lobby do. They just have their act together. And it's most yeah. of it is not illegal as far as their control of the Congress. It's just ugly as hell, you know. But yep. uh, they do they do a good job, Phil. <laughs> I don't know. It's terrible, but it's great yep. for them. All right, well, thanks very much. You scare the hell okay, out of me God. again. Right, bye-bye. Phil Giraldi, everybody. He's at unz.com, unz.com, and the American Conservative Magazine. Hey, all Scott here. Ever wanted to help support the show and own silver at the same time? Well, a friend of mine, libertarian activist Arlo Pignati, has invented the alternative currency with the most promise of them all. QR Silver Commodity Discs, the first ever QR code one ounce silver pieces. Just scan the back of one with your phone and get the instant spot price. They're perfect for saving or spending at the market. And anyone who donates $100 or more to the Scott Horton Show at scotthorton.org slash donate gets one. 
That's scotthorton.org slash donate. And if you'd like to learn and order more, send them a message at commoditydiscs.com or check them out on Facebook at slash commoditydiscs. And thanks. Phone records, financial and location data, Prism, Tempora, X-Keyscore, Boundless Informant. Hey, y'all, Scott Horton here for offnow.org. Now, here's the deal. Due to the Snowden revelations, we have a great opportunity for a short period of time to get some real rollback of the national surveillance state. Now, they're already trying to tire us by introducing fake reforms in the Congress. And the courts, they betrayed their sworn oaths to the Constitution and Bill of Rights again and again and can in no way be trusted to stop the abuses for us. We've got to do it ourselves. How? We nullify it at the state level. It's still not easy. The Off Now project of the 10th Amendment Center has gotten off to a great start. I mean it. There's real reason to be optimistic here. They've gotten their model legislation introduced all over the place. In state after state, I've lost count. More than a dozen. You're always wondering, yeah, but what can we do? Here's something. Something important. Something that can work if we do the work. Get started cutting off the NSA support in your state. Go to offnow.org. Oh, John Kerry's Mideast peace talks have gone nowhere. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here for the Council for the National Interest at CouncilForTheNationalInterest.org. U.S. military and financial support for Israel's permanent occupations of the West Bank and Gaza Strip is immoral, and it threatens national security by helping generate terrorist attacks against our country. And face it, it's bad for Israel, too. Without our unlimited support, they would have much more incentive to reach a lasting peace with their neighbors. It's past time for us to make our government stop making matters worse. Help support CNI at CouncilForTheNationalInterest.org. Hey, y'all, Scott Horton here for CashIntoCoins.com. So you want to buy some Bitcoins? CashIntoCoins.com makes it fast, easy, and safe to get Bitcoins. Just deposit the money into their account at any of the major banks they support, and then just email them a picture of the receipt in your Bitcoin address, and you get your Bitcoins. Almost always the same day it clears. In a tough, competitive new market, CashIntoCoins.com has the advantage. A great system and great customer service to keep you coming back. That's CashIntoCoins.com. Just click the link in the right margin at ScottHorton.org.